Changing glances. As I was saying before I was so rudely interrupted. Reset to nominal future. Hey YouTube Nation, now? can you hear us now? Do we have audio? I see smiley face. Does that mean you can hear us? Brandon's smiling because we... All right, Bo says that he can hear. There's just a little delay in audio. Attention, right. please. Let's get this started. They said that they can hear us, that there's a little bit of a delay. Kind of low, but can hear a bit. Reset. Let's get it started now. I told Let's you guys this was either going to be great or going to be a shit show. <laughs> I would just say start rolling with it if y'all can hear. Sorry? Yeah, go ahead. Start rolling, restart, just say hey. All right. Let's go ahead and get this started, guys. Now that you can hear us, there may be a little bit of a lag on the audio. We'll take a look at that after the show, see if we can figure that out. But let's go ahead and just roll into this. So this is the BDE show, your weekly energy show if you're the type of person that hates morning notes you think jim kramer sucks this is the show for you we're gonna get right into it because we have some big news drop yesterday with conoco phillips buying shells permian acreage for 9.5 billion tendies it's a lot of money comes out to approximately forty two thousand dollars a net acre or fifty four thousand dollars per barrel and if you remember Conoco acquired Concho earlier this year for $13 billion. So they've been on a uh, M&A streak. Chuck, you got any insight on that one? Did two things I read reading the press release. One, you know, the price is $9.5 billion, but the effective date's July 1st. So they're talking about closing in the fourth quarter. 
think about it. You got four, maybe five months cash flow offsetting it. So Conoco is not sending nine and a half billion dollars to Shell. It'll be less than that. But I think the bigger point that I haven't seen anywhere, and we bounced up against this back uh, in the Delaware Basin when we had Panther up against Shell. All that Shell acreage is checkerboarded out there. So we're talking single section laterals. If I had to have a team to throw at a bunch of checkerboarded acreage to cut deals with my offsetting neighbors, it would be the Concho team. And so, you know, the economics out there from going from single section laterals to double section laterals, that's 3x the IRR. So I don't know that that got priced into the deal, but that's a lot of freaking upside to let that team get after. Yeah, and then you also had Pioneer Natural Resources putting their Delaware assets on the uh, auction block for $2 billion plus. Pretty interesting there. Uh, Calling Matt Gallagher. (laughs) Yeah, Matt Gallagher, uh, Parsley Energy, selling out to uh, Pioneer earlier this year or later part of 2020. Could you imagine the Twitter explosion if Brian and Matt bought that back? Oh, yeah. Twitter Twitter would go It wild. would melt down. So, yeah, um, Pioneer is looking to divest that. So it's pretty interesting seeing some big movements. You know, if you look at uh, Shell divesting to Conoco, you have that court mandate that uh, put pressure on Shell to cut emissions by 2030. And so it was expected that you had some divestitures out of oil and gas properties. I'm assuming that that was kind of the catalyst for them and, selling and, this. And you're going to send $7 billion back to your uh, shareholders, and you're going to pay down some amount of debt if you're Shell. So probably a win for Shell as well. Yeah. And then your your world, private equity, you had Warwick Investment Group buying some Eagleford assets, acquiring Rosewood Resources. Don't we have some, don't we have some video footage of that? Yeah, I, I heard we had some footage. We only just met. All I want is you. I just want us to be together. I mean, Colin, there is a lot to do down in the Eagleford. I mean, if you think about the time period when all that was drilled, think pre-2014 oil crash, you had $80, $90 oil, you were drilling horizontals, but old stage fracks. There's a lot to do in the Eagle for that being said, I've got under good authority that Warwick paid almost two X the next highest bidder on that deal. Jeez. That's uh you ever heard of the uh, winner's curse in auction theory? Achieved by a couple of uh, petroleum engineers, I think back in the seventies and they did a lot of uh, analysis and research and saw that, Hey, even if you won a bid on an asset, you always screwed yourself over because you overpaid for the <laughs> asset. So, well, um, if if value is a normal distribution, the median point is right there in the middle. The outlier, by definition, wins the auction. So, yeah, that's why they run them. So, I heard you had uh, some rumors through the rumor mill uh, in the uh, oil and gas world. Is that true? I, maybe so. Tim, why don't you give us a clip? You didn't hear this from us. So, word is, shit's about to get real with Harold Hamm and his perpetual problem. (laughs) Word on the street is the next hearing is October 28th. So, tell me a little bit about the backstory of what happened with Harold Hamm. I know there was some kind of (laughs) espionage-esque behavior going up in uh, Oklahoma. What actually happened? Well, so, allegedly... Let's say that. <laughs> Allegedly, Harold Ham was thinking that someone was spying on him, and so he authorized a group to go pose as subletters to a lease so that they could go in. And literally the security camera in the building where his team went in captured the people taking photos, digging through file cabinets and the like, and when they sued Harold Ham. The responding lawsuit, from, or the response from Harold Ham said, "Don't worry, I didn't find you. Didn't steal from me." <laughs> <laughs> I 
Harold Ham's a legend. I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I when I, I got to meet G. Gordon Liddy, one of the Watergate spies, like 20 years ago, and I told him, I said, "Hey, G. Gordon, that was really cool. You're the guy that didn't fess up. You didn't turn in uh, anyone else." And he goes, "That's not true." And I went, "Really?" And he goes, "Well, the Cubans. We hired three Cubans to break into the building with us, and when we put the when they put the Cubans on the witness stand." The prosecutor said, which one of these guys did it? And the Cubans all to a T said, I don't know. All those white guys look the same to me. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to have to keep our eyes on, you know, what's happening up in Oklahoma. We may have to do a video on, on like, just kind of this spy story of oil and gas. Um, it's funny to me because it's so boomer. Like, it's boomer as fuck to think, like, hey, let's actually go in their office and physically look at what they're doing. Um, just See, and I thought it was genius. So you're probably <laughs> right about it being totally boomer. So second rumor that we have in the rumor bill from, uh, you know, this is like, this is the meat of this show is we're just going to give you all the good shit. Kane Anderson has consolidated its mid-content assets under the former 89er energy management team. It's obviously not the first time and certainly won't be the last time private equity has paid up for the beaver. <laughs> Can't believe you just had me read a beaver joke on air. <laughs> What's going on there with Kane Anderson, Chuck? No, I, they had a lot of good assets in the uh, stack scoop uh, that make a at $5 gas. That's actually something to watch. I think that's something that pops up in our industry going forward is stack scoop. $5 gas, NGLs at 60, 65% of WTI. That's real. It's money making. Okay. I'm going to end this abruptly because I want to get into my favorite segment. Okay. Of this show. Like, I'm not even going to give you a chance to uh, expand on that. Let's get into shotgun wedding. This So this week's shotgun wedding shout out is going to Mike Worth over at Chevron, which probably one of my favorite stories this week. Let me tell you what Mike said real quick. He was quoted as saying this. I think it was on Mad Money. It was good. good. <laughs> one of the things we've chosen not to go into is wind and solar. These are technologies that are relatively mature. There's plenty of capital that's available the returns in wind and solar are actually being bid down, and we've concluded that management in our company can't create value for shareholders by going into wind and solar. I love this quote, one, because, you know, with all of the uh, energy transition talk that we've seen over the last, you know, year and a half, two years, Mike Horst is coming out and laying it on the table and saying, fuck you, we're going heavy on oil and gas. We're going to return capital to our shareholders and pay out dividends. I gotta respect that. Like I'm, I'm bullish on Chevron just for that. I'm like, hey, look, you're an oil company. Let's stick to oil. But on that point, they do have a lot of climate and renewable projects going on too. What do you think about that? Well, I think if natural gas is at five dollars an M, you can say that with a little more <laughs> oomph than that's that's than what I appreciate <laughs> most. Is like he says this as nat gas is just skyrocketing. Like oil and gas is getting its swagger back, and it's like. Fuck you, renewables. We're going well, to go heavy on oil and gas. And I could never understand why an oil and gas company whose core competency is drilling a well and producing a well is suddenly going to be great at putting down solar panels or putting down a wind farm. I guess there are some land skills involved in that. But other than that, it's different businesses. And so, you know, kind of core competencies, I agree with it. But don't forget... What happened to Mike Worth, though, in May, his shareholders passed a proposal saying they wanted lower carbon emissions, and the board was actually opposed to that proposal, and it passed anyway. So I, that put him on the path of this energy transition spotlight that they had on September 14th, where his pitch was higher returns, lower carbon. He said the stuff you liked, but at the end of the day, he's announced eight different carbon reduction joint ventures in the last month so i mean if you're sitting there and you're mike worth dude i just think it's a hairy situation we got a comment from hogtown florida or fl he says guy without the hat pull the mic closer to you first off frack slap guy without guy the without hat, the hat. <laughs> 
Second off, Tim, why is my audio, why is my audio quiet, man? I've got a thousand dollar mic set up here and people can't hear me. What the fuck's going on? Appreciate you, Hogtown. <laughs> hey, Hogtown, <laughs> consider it a blessing. <laughs> All right, what we got next, Chuck? Now let's uh, let, let's. Uh... Cause you know sometimes it's just. A All right, guys, I'm going to preface this just by saying the only way I could get Chuck to actually do the show is if I allowed him to do these little clips. And so he's been excited. I'm glad that he has some purpose in his life now. So with all my years of advanced <laughs> degrees, education at Rice University, I make clips. So what is this week's hairy situation? It was Mike Worth. I thought we had another Harry situation. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, don't we have one with Kendrick Morgan trying to get into green hydrogen? I think that's right. I mean, they it's ref hairy. they refit a terminal to take biofuels. Yeah. How does that make any sense? My boy, uh, Blake Street Bomber on Twitter had a really good thread about this, uh, just talking about the inflation that you see in other commodities, especially food, uh, you know, such as corn and soybeans and things like that. And the second order effects that you have, okay, let's convert midstream assets to uh, these biofuels but what, is, what impact does that have on food supply over the long term? And he was dropping some great charts. We'll have to link to that in the show notes so that people can go check that out. Well, and there's no way that converting food to fuel in a usable format is not waste. It just can't be. Yeah. I think it was, uh, I can't remember if it was Charlie or Warren Buffett, but they essentially, you know, long story short, said that, converting food into energy is one of the stupidest ideas that there is so um i think i gotta agree with well, you so i think that's a hairy situation kind of morgan trying to get into uh biofuels but if it makes some money i guess go for it well don't worry the u.s government pays farmers not to grow food when there are hungry people on the planet but that's a whole nother thing so speaking of uh asshole governments don't trust china china is asshole Also, I just seen this comment from uh, Brandon Estes saying this is a multi-dollar podcast. It's at least four <laughs> four bucks. So appreciate you, Brandon. Um, <laughs> so yeah, China's in the news. A lot happening with the economy over there. Um, someone on Twitter said, uh, I think it was '90s random consultant on Twitter said that he couldn't wait for us to cover the uh, Chinese economy. So here it is for you, big guy. Um, anyways, big story is uh, Evergrande's pending implosion, uh, defaulting on their debt. I can't remember how many billions of dollars of debt they have, but we're talking um, a, a lot of money here. I think we have a uh, video clip from, from Trisha Curtis. Time is it? Okay, Evergrande, why it's important. Evergrande is the second largest property developer in China. Real estate is a huge component of the Chinese economy. So it's nearly 30% of the Chinese economy. Um, that's a massive amount of wealth for the wealthy and the average Chinese that are locked up in real estate. So if they see those property values go down, that's going to be problematic. And this is all in the midst of a, a greater crackdown that's going on within China by, by the government, by Xi Jinping. So it's very tricky on whether or not they're going to bail this out. The reason this matters is because oil demand in China is the single largest growth story in the world. Oil demand is about 14 million barrels per day in 2019. It was 14 0.2 um, million barrels per day in 2020. It was the only growth story in 2020, really, for oil demand. They produce about 4 million barrels per day, and they import about 10 to 12 million barrels per day. Huge story on the oil demand side. So that was great uh, insight from Trisha. Not going to lie, like I don't know much about China. I know that I'm about to ape into Alibaba stock because it's looking tasty. I was telling you about that yesterday. I don't even know how you – she says Evergrande. I say Evergrande because I'm from Texas. So, uh, Well, I, I mean, it, say it, right. it shouldn't be underappreciated that China is levered 270% of their GDP. And, you know, let's cut to the chase. That's a shitload. 
and at least some of that leverage is backed up by the huge growth that you're going to see in the China economy. And if that growth doesn't show up because all of a sudden they're defaulting on their debt and Evergrande, to take your parlance, <laughs> missed two interest payments yesterday to uh, various lenders. Now they've got 30-day default type provisions before anything happens, but shit could hit the fan in China. And just think of all of the world's economies, including oil demand, that are backed up by that growth. We had a comment from uh, Dara Richardson saying, don't worry, Hunter's p paintings are on the way to help China's economy. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, guys, we plan on having a lot more live guests on the show in the future, people calling in, people joining us here in the studio. I wanted my boy case van hoff to come on the show today but uh just wasn't able to make it happen uh both busy and just didn't work out the logistics but tim bring up that image from uh case talking to uh well hold on hold on one second before we bring case up we did get an expert to come in today so call let's ask an expert hey frack slap congrats on your success at digital wildcatters you guys truly invented the energy business. That said, you're still a little bitch for not smoking the pound of weed. Come on, frack. A bet's a bet. I'm watching our guys, like Tim watching that clip, like acting like they had no idea what that clip was. Like, did you not watch that before Chuck told you to put that in the show? <laughs> you just blindly letting Chuck put whatever clips he wants in the show. That Heck yeah. Great you show up for rundown, <laughs> Colin, you get to put clips in too. So, hey, bring up that, bring up that screenshot. Do, do from this, case. do this, do victory for the shareholders, roll into the story and then we'll pull up cases. All right. It. Take down that comment from Reese real quick so I can see this post from uh case. So, okay. Other day, Jim Cramer, it's on mad money, loser show says diamondback energy is the last company i expect to return capital to its shareholders our boy our boy case on twitter retweeted him said do some research dude we're the first emp to initiate a dividend in 10 years in 2018 and more than triple by today we didn't cut in 2020 is that returning capital donked on his ass i love it man i love twitter i just love the smoke on there what do you think about uh diamondback and what they're doing chuck no, I mean, I think, you know, I had uh, dinner the other night with what I'll call as an old timer CEO who was, oh, all these investors just want free cash flow. And I think it was totally lost on them. Two things. One, basically investors are saying, you guys aren't transparent. We don't know what your company's worth. We get one uh, reserve report a year. We're using that to try to value you. And then two, I didn't want to point out the obvious, but EMP just doesn't have a lot of credibility. Your investors are basically telling you, we don't want you to drill a well. We want you to send us money uh, instead. And so I think to bridge that gap, doing what Diamondback did, initiating a dividend, growing that dividend, returning capital is the right thing to do. I also think what Oventive did with their new capital allocation with this framework they've set up where they're going to return uh, various percentages of the free cash flow each quarter to their shareholders goes a long way to uh, restore credibility with these investors. It also shouldn't be lost that maybe Oventive needed to have a new CEO to be able to, to implement that plan. My favorite part of that whole segment was how we left up the picture so that we couldn't see your face while you're talking. Um, I got a face for podcasting. <laughs> Be great on the audio. Um, we don't give a damn about seeing you on the video, though. <laughs> All right. Well, then let's run the clip of victory for the shareholder. Dude, victory I, for the shareholders, man. That's I just... A, I just want to know. I think that's something that we can play too often, and when yeah, we, we get, need to celebrate like, yeah. it when it when it actually when it actually happens. I do want it noted for the record. Any time I did one of these segments, the fatter fa the fatter person in the clip, I always put your face on it <laughs> instead of mine. <laughs> Is that the slimming effect for you? <laughs> exactly. All right, let's move in. 
I, I think we got one more segment before we end the show. Uh, it's run, a, it's a good run segment. the clip no, for us, Tim. Good segment. What segment we? What the fuck? Fuck, he's doing. All right, this week's what the fuck of the week goes to Joe Biden. After months, if not years, of resistance to oil and gas production, you know, drilling on federal land, shutting down Keystone, institutional capital, divesting out of oil and gas, what do you think happens? You get in a supply crunch, especially with pent-up demand from 2020, and prices start going up. Now gas starts going up, oil starts going up, gasoline starts going up. So Biden had some comments talking about gas prices are going up even though that there's evidence that they should be going down. And it's like, what the fuck are you talking about? Last month, you asked OPEC to up production. We have Europe asking Russia to up production. Like, it's, sorry, it's like, come on, give me more oil, daddy. Like, it's pathetic. And then you have the balls to come out here and say, we have evidence that there's profiteers and bad actors that are making money on gas prices. So every time we talk about advocacy in the energy business, and we've talked about it, you know, seven or eight podcasts this summer, one of the things I've always thought with advocacy is we're a masturbatory menagerie. I worked on that alliteration last night for you, Colin. I have no idea what that means. Exactly. <laughs> no, but we sit around a bunch of energy folks. We make jokes. We say, ooh, Biden sucks and all that. But I don't know that we've actually changed anyone's mind. But this, I think, is a wedge issue for us. And I want us to spend just a second on this. In the new infrastructure bill, section 4081, little a, two, capital A, little i, of the Internal Revenue Code of 1986, they are suggesting that the gasoline, other than aviation gasoline tax, go from 18.3 cents to 53.3 cents. If you think about that, that's a 10% inflation on the price of gas to consumers, that's our wedge issue. That's something that we as an industry should be printing out on every gas receipt. You and I ought to be talking on the podcast every day about it. We ought to be tweeting about it because that might change people's mind on that. And so, you know, the whole BS from Biden putting all these things in place to raise prices and then saying gas prices, gasoline prices should come down and then basically asking for a 35 cent a gallon tax increase, total bullshit. Yeah, and I mean, taxes like this disproportionately affect lower income families, right? I mean, this uh, a 30 to 50 cent tax on a gallon of gasoline is gonna make a dent in their pocketbook. So, you know, speaking of that, I think we have a ch Tax the rich. Because only tax rich, rich folks buy gasoline. There you go. Tax the rich or just tax the poor through hidden uh, taxes on gasoline, whichever way you want to go about it. So anyways, guys, that's going to wrap up this week's show. Sorry for the technical difficulties at the beginning. We'll figure this out. We got a pretty complex setup here uh, for the live stream. Appreciate all you guys getting in the comments, uh, especially you, Hogtown. Um you know, giving us a thumbs up. Hopefully we got to talk about Nat Gas enough for you. Check us out. We're going to be doing this every Tuesday, 1030 a.m. Um, if you ever have anything you want us to talk about, just send it to us either on YouTube, find us on Twitter. I'm at Frack Slap on Twitter. He is uh, Nimble, Nimble Fatty. Nimble Fatty.